is about half an hour long, not too, too long. Uh, but in that video, I start with a uh, brief discussion of how do we decide what the functional currency is. Um, and uh, those factors are indicated in um, IAS 21, paragraphs 9, 10, and so on. So the primary factors that you want to look at is what currency determines sales prices and operating costs. And a related point is uh, which economic environment uh, affects the degree of competition and regulation for the organization. So if you have a company whose sales occur primarily in Canada and are denominated in Canadian dollars, then you would say the functional currency is the Canadian dollar. If sales occur in other countries and are not denominated in Canadian dollars, then the functional currency is not the Canadian dollar and would be the currency of the um, countries where primarily the sales take place. The second primary factor to look at is operating costs, so costs of labor and materials. Are they incurred in Canada and denominated in Canadian dollars or not? If yes, the Canadian dollar should be seen as the functional currency. And uh, the related point about competition and regulation, uh, are the company's competitors Canadian? Is the company listed on a Canadian stock exchange? Well, if the answer is yes, then the Canadian dollar should be seen as the functional currency. If not, then it wouldn't be the case. You want to put more emphasis on the primary factors. If your analysis of the primary factors is inconclusive, then you want to look at the secondary factors, which are basically pertaining to financing. Where is this company raised? Where has this company raised its financing? If the debt and equity is raised in Canada, in Canadian dollars, then the Canadian dollar should be seen as the functional currency. If not, then the foreign currency. And does the company maintain its operating surpluses in Canadian dollars or not? If the company maintains its operating surpluses in Canadian dollars, we would argue the Canadian dollar should be the functional currency. Then you have five additional factors which apply to a um, foreign operation. So foreign operation is, it can be a subsidiary, it can be a branch, it can be a um, joint venture, right? Be an associate. So wherever you have the Canadian reporting company that needs to um, include into its income, some of the numbers, some of the financial information pertaining to a foreign operation. So if it was a parent subsidiary relationship, the Canadian parent company will need to consolidate. And so for consolidation, we can't put together Canadian dollars and uh, euros, right? So you have to first convert the euros into Canadian dollars and then consolidate. So that's the idea. Look, when looking at the functional currency of a branch, subsidiary, joint venture, etc., you want to ask these questions. Is the foreign operation primarily an extension of the parent's operations? And what would be an indicator? Does it sell goods imported from the parent company? Uh, if the answer is yes, well, then you would argue it's a, an integrated foreign operation. And so the Canadian dollar should be the functional currency. If not, then the foreign currency will be seen as the functional currency. How much of autonomy do they have? Well, the degree of autonomy is a good indicator. If you have more autonomy for the foreign operation, then uh, uh, you would argue that uh, it is self-sustaining and therefore the foreign currency should be seen as the functional currency. The volume of intercompany transactions would be uh, another indicator. If you have a high volume of uh, intercompany transactions, well, then that would support uh, the Canadian dollars being the functional currency. 
what is a high proportion is of course uh, a matter of judgment. Um, cash flows, so does the foreign operation directly affect the cash flows of the parent company? If the answer is yes, then the Canadian dollar will be seen as the functional currency. And the last bit is, is the foreign operation capable of um, paying its bills without relying on the parent for help? If the answer is yes, then the foreign currency would be the functional currency. If the foreign operation relies on the parent company for making its bill payments, well then, it is essentially an integrated operation and the Canadian dollar will be the currency. CPA Canada typically asks questions where you have to apply these indicators, these factors to a, like this, is, this would be an example of a small case. So example 17.1, Jan 1st, 2012, Caprice Enterprises, which is a publicly traded Canadian company, bought 75% of the outstanding common shares of Aussie Limited, a company located in Perth, Australia. The local currency is the Australian dollar. Now, of course, with 75% of the common shares, the Canadian company Caprice has become its parent. So Caprice needs to consolidate uh, the financial information of Aussie because it's a public company, right? Caprice is a publicly traded company. Private companies can choose not to consolidate, but public companies under IFRS, if you have a subsidiary, you have to consolidate. Now, when we look at the details for Aussie, approximately 45% of Aussie sales are directly to Caprice, which is, remember, a Canadian company. 40% of its sales are to other companies located in Canada, and the remaining 15% to companies in Australia. All of Aussie's main operating costs, including raw materials, labor, and equipment are acquired locally in Australia and Australian dollars. Included in Aussie's current liabilities is a bank loan obtained from a bank in Canada denominated in Canadian dollars. Aussie's board of directors and senior managers are appointed by Caprice. So if you were to try to kind of go, what should Aussie's functional currency be? You should first look at the primary factors. And primary factors are, well, what currency determines sales prices? Over here, Aussie has 45 plus 40, 85% of its sales in Canada. So that would indicate uh, the Canadian dollar should be seen as the currency that um, determines the sales prices. However, the fact that Aussie's operating costs for materials, labor, and equipment are all incurred in Australian dollars will indicate that the Australian dollar is the functional curve. So you don't have any clear indicator from looking at the primary factors. One, the sales prices bit suggests it should be the Canadian dollar, but when you look at the, uh, the input costs, it's the Australian dollar. So you have a tie here. You can't really go one way or the other. Then you should look at financing and operating surplus as the additional fact, the secondary factors. Now the currency in which financing is obtained, while it's true that our friend Aussie has a, has a bank loan in Canadian dollars, it's part of current liabilities. We don't know whether it's a big, big proportion because I'm sure it must have other sources of financing which could very well be in Australian dollars. So. On its own, that bank loan is a is a is a is a somewhat weaker piece of evidence. The currency in which um, operating surpluses are kept, well, that there's no there's no information that we have on that, so we can't really say anything about that. Then you have to kind of look at the additional factors because you don't have conclusive evidence. You know, you the sales prices are tipping the balance in favor of the Canadian dollar. The input costs are tipping the balance in favor of the Australian dollar. We have a little bit of additional evidence for the Canadian dollar, given the fact that there's a bank loan in Canadian dollars, but on its own, that's pretty slim. So we need more evidence. 
right? We need, need more evidence. And here, when we look at the fact that the proportion of um, Aussie sales with the Canadian parent is significant, 45% of Aussie's um, sales are to the Canadian parent. So that's significant volume of intra-company transactions. And the fact that its board of directors and senior management are appointed by the parent, the Canadian parent, it indicates Aussie does not have a whole lot of autonomy. So these factors, along with what we saw earlier, would indicate that Aussie's functional currency is the Canadian dollar. So Aussie will be seen as an integrated foreign subsidiary of Caprice. And what Caprice needs to do is therefore, when it translates the financial statements of Aussie for purposes of consolidation, it must use the functional currency translation method, also called the temporal method. And what that method entails, we will be looking at shortly. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay, if that is so, then let us move into an actual translation situation. So example 17.2 tells us about United Manufacturing, a company that was incorporated on Jan 1st year three. December 31st year five, CMC, a Canadian company, purchased 80% of the outstanding common shares of United. United's comparative balance sheet and year-rate income statements are followed. So these are numbers for United. These are all amounts in US dollars. Um, year seven balance sheet, year eight balance sheet. And we have the income statement for the year ended December 31st, 2008. There is some additional information along with exchange rates provided. And uh, this question is gonna take us a fair bit of time. So uh, please make sure that you take lots of notes and uh, you know, ask lots of questions. Do not, uh, you know, do not bite your tongue. You gotta ask your questions because this piece uh, will be the big question on your final exam. This can be as much as 25% of your final exam. 25, maybe 30% sometimes, depending on the total marks allocated. 25 to 30% of the final exam will basically be this topic's question. Have to make sure that you absolutely get what we're doing. So in 17.1, I said, I showed you how you have to sometimes argue one way or the other what the functional currency should be. Now, of course, if a question counts for 25 to 30% of the final, I can't afford for people to make wild guesses or wild choices. So usually in these cases, what we do is we tell you what the functional currency is. So assume that United's functional currency is the Canadian dollar, or assume that United's functional currency is the US dollar. So we say, you know, given that, assume that is the case, then, what needs to be done is every year the company, the Canadian parent, will calculate a translation gain or loss and also translate the financial statements. We will focus only on translating the uh, income statement and the balance sheet. But of course, for consolidation purposes, you also have to do the um, uh, translated uh, statement of changes in equity and those things as well. So there's basically 
we're good. We are going to be looking at both methods, the functional currency translation method, the temporal method, basically, and then the other, the current trade method, which is also called the presentation currency translation method. Um, the first is used when the Canadian dollar is the functional currency. When the Canadian dollar is the functional currency, we use the temporal method or the FCT method. If the US dollar, the foreign currency, is the functional currency, you would use the uh, current rate method. The calculation of the translation gain or loss is done very, very, very differently. Okay, very differently for the two methods. Under the temporal method, the calculation of the translation gain or loss is done with reference to changes in net monetary position. So the structure is we start with the beginning net monetary position and then look at the changes in the net monetary position. There are a bunch of reasons that will drive changes in the net monetary position. Adding those change values to the beginning net monetary position, we get a calculated amount for the ending net monetary position. We compare that calculated amount to the actual ending net monetary position. Any difference between the actual ending net monetary position and the calculated ending net monetary position is the translation gain or loss. If the actual ending net monetary position is more, then you'll have a gain. If the actual ending net monetary position is less than the calculated amount, there'll be a loss. Okay. We first have to do the calculation of the net monetary position in the foreign currency. So in this particular case, it's the US dollar. Then we convert the US dollars into Canadian dollars. All right, so this final calculation of the translation gain or loss depends on the dollar amounts in Canadian dollars. There can never be a translation gain or loss in the US dollars here, the foreign currency, because of course your ending net monetary position should be the same as far as US dollars are concerned. It's only when you translate the amounts where different exchange rates come into play that there can be a difference between the actual ending net monetary position and the calculated, right? So this is really a very, very, very high level view of what you do when computing the translation gain or loss. It is gonna get messy, so sit tight and take lots of notes. So first, net monetary position. Net monetary position is calculated by subtracting the monetary liabilities from the monetary assets. And we're looking at the beginning net monetary position. So if you're talking about the beginning net monetary position, the calculation is beginning monetary assets minus beginning monetary liabilities. The word monetary, a monetary item is the right to receive or an obligation to deliver a fixed determinable number of units of currency. So it includes, as far as assets are concerned, it includes cash, and accounts receivable. So these are our monetary items. And as far as liabilities are concerned, most liabilities are monetary liabilities because you have to pay for those. But there can be non-monetary liabilities as well. For example, when you have um, a provision for warranty, like you don't have, you don't pay your your customer cash when the customer brings back an item sold under warranty, you have to fix it, right? You have to fix it or replace it. You don't pay the customer cash when they bring back something under warranty. So provision for warranty would be an example of a non-monetary liability. For our course, we will just assume that uh, all liabilities are monetary. And then as far as monetary assets are concerned, it'll be cash and accounts receivable. 
prepaids prepaids are non monetary so if there was any kind of prepaid expenses those are non monetary okay so at the beginning of the year so if our year is 2008 at the beginning of 2008 the beginning monetary assets must have been the cash and the accounts receivable brought forward from year seven. And the beginning li monetary liabilities will be the current liabilities and the long-term liabilities carried forward from year seven. So cash of 420,000 plus accounts receivable of 410,000 minus current liabilities 640,000 long-term liabilities 4.2 million gives us beginning net monetary position of four million ten thousand dollar net liability the net liability because the total of the monetary assets is way smaller than the total of the liabilities monetary assets minus monetary liabilities the monetary liabilities are huge right 4.84 million compared to the $830,000 that we're seeing for the monetary assets. So our beginning net monetary position was a liability of 4 million 10,000 US dollars. Any folks okay with that? If so, can you please take a minute to calculate the ending net monetary position in US dollars? What's the ending net monetary position? And you don't have to share the answer, just do the math so that when I reveal the answer, you can compare whether you got it right. I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but I do want people to, to try to do some work as we go along. If you like, you can save a copy of this file and. Uh, you can actually download this file. If you click here, file, you can make a copy, you can download it as Excel. So you can actually keep doing work as along, along with me, right? So end of year eight, what's the net monetary position? It would be cash, 350,000, plus accounts receivable, 480,000, minus 560,000 of the current liabilities, and also minus 4.1 million of the long-term liability. So that will give you a net in monetary position at the end of the year, an actual net monetary position of, again, it's a liability position, $3,830,000. Okay, hopefully you were able to get that. Now, to translate the exchange rates you use are the exchange rates for when that monetary position was computed. So the beginning net monetary position is computed using the dollar amounts that existed on December 31st, year seven. So use the exchange rate for December 31st, year seven. That exchange rate is 1.33. December 31st, year seven, 1.33. So beginning net monetary position, you will translate at 1.33. So you'll multiply the 4,010,000 liability with the 1.33 to get equivalent Canadian dollars, 5,333,300.
for your ending net monetary position actual, the actual ending net monetary position is calculated using the dollars that existed at December 31st, year eight. So what you wanna do is take the exchange rate for December 31st, year eight, the ending rate, 1.22, okay? So the ending actually net, actual net monetary position, you translate using the closing rate for the year, 1.22. So 1.22 times 3,830,000 gives us 4,672,600. Now you'd notice there's a fair bit of gap in between. We will be filling that. We will be like taking a look at the changes in the net monetary position. Now, what brings about changes in, a net, in the net monetary position? If your net monetary position is basically made up of monetary assets and monetary liabilities, folks, well, monetary assets are cash and accounts receivable. Something that increases cash or increases receivables will increase the net monetary position. Something that reduces liabilities will increase net monetary position as well. Right? So net monetary position, you can we can type that out. Net monetary position is increased with an increase in cash accounts receivable or a decrease in liabilities. And if we ask, well, what happens? How is net monetary position decreased? NMP is decreased with a decrease in cash or AR or an increase in liabilities. So where should we be looking for, so where to look, right? You wanna look at the income statement. And you wanna look at the non-monetary assets. We've taken up all the liabilities. You said all the liabilities are monetary. So you wanna look at the non-monetary assets and you wanna look at the shareholders equity. And this will for some of you feel very much like uh, learning to do the cash flow statement under the direct method. Okay, so this will bring back fond memories of a cash flow. So on that, at least on that count, you have learned something similar to this in the past. So first you wanna go through the income statement. And if you go through the income statement, you'd say, well, the first line is sales. So sales, does that increase cash or accounts receivable? The answer is yes. You either have cash sales or you have sales on credit, or sometimes, you know, customer may have prepaid money and you would have an unearned revenue liability. And when you provide the customer with it, the unearned revenue liability is decreased. Either way, sales increases net monetary position. So $10 million of sales will increase our net monetary position. Net monetary position goes up with sales. Okay. Next line is cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory. Cost of goods sold in and by itself does not change, does not affect our monetary position. 
gross profit is simply sales minus cost of goods sold. Selling and admin expenses. So when we incur selling and admin expenses, rent expense, salaries expense, et cetera, et cetera, those expenses have to be paid for in cash or you'd have a liability being incurred. They will reduce, decrease our net monetary position. However, this amount of 2384000 includes depreciation. What we know about depreciation is depreciation is a non-cash cost and being a non-cash cost, depreciation will not affect net monetary position because depreciation does not result in a decrease in cash or, or anything. It's just debit depreciation expense credit, accumulated depreciation. So selling and admin expenses do reduce our monetary liability, our monetary net monetary position, but because this two million three eighty four thousand includes depreciation, we will have to do a little bit of calculation, figure out how much of the two million three hundred and eighty four thousand, the total cost, includes how much of it is depreciation. So we'll have to figure out how much is depreciation. Nothing is explicitly mentioned. So we'll have to go take a look at the balance sheet and ask ourselves, okay, now which amongst our long-lived assets are subject to depreciation? Land we know is not depreciated. So we only have plant and equipment. Now plant and equipment, we've not been provided information on accumulated depreciation. So the plant and equipment information is provided net of accumulated depreciation. So basically the depreciation has been the accumulated depreciation has been taken off from these numbers. In order to figure out what the depreciation was for the year, that we need to make a T account to determine what the depreciation cost must have been for the year. So our beginning plant and equipment balance was 6.8 million. The ending plant and equipment balance is 6.6 .6 million. It might be very tempting to just say 6.8 million minus 6.6 .6 million depreciation was 200,000. Don't go jump to those conclusions because there could have been other transactions affecting plant and equipment. So yes, you take the beginning and the ending balances for sure. You say, okay, our beginning balance was 6.8 million, ending balance was 6.6 .6 million. Now, during 2008, new equipment was purchased costing $1.2 million. New equipment costing $1.2 million was purchased on April 1st. And when we purchased the new equipment, plant and equipment would have increased by $1.2 million. So beginning balance of 6.8 mil plus the amount purchased 1.2 mil, that should be $8 million. However, the ending balance is 6.6. .6. So depreciation for the year must have been the 1.4. Okay, does that make sense? 1.4 million for depreciation? So depreciation was 1.4 million. The total of the selling and admin expenses was 2,384,000. If you take away 1.4 million of depreciation, the rest of the selling and admin expenses, we said reduced net monetary position. So that amount is 984,000 and notice, I put that as a negative because it lowers net monetary position. Sales, I put that as a positive because sales increases net monetary position. So something that increases net monetary position is an add. Something that reduces net monetary position is a negative.
Okay. Right, going back, other expenses, 836,000, will reduce net monetary position. Interest expense, 420,000, will reduce net monetary position. Income tax expense, 864,000, will reduce net monetary position. So 836,000, 420,000, and 864,000, those are three numbers that will reduce the net monetary position. That's good. We are done with the income statement portion. Now we got to go and look at the non-monetary assets and the shareholders' equity numbers. So coming back here, non-monetary assets, we have inventory. So beginning inventory was 670,000. Ending inventory is 800,000. And we sold inventory with a cost of $4.2 million during the year. So we make go and make a T account for inventory, beginning balance, ending balance, and when you put the cost of goods sold on the credit side, we're able to calculate how much of inventory was purchased. So you guys know ending inventory plus cost of goods sold minus beginning inventory gives us purchases. So the amount of inventory we purchased during the year. $4,330,000. You buy inventory, debit inventory, credit accounts payable. So the purchase of inventory reduces net monetary position. $4,330,000. Reduction of net monetary position because of purchase of inventory. Inventory purchases, $4,330,000. Reduces net monetary position. So Feroz has got a question. What else will come under monetary assets except cash and accounts receivable? Um, you can have some kind of a note receivable, Feroz, that could show up. So <clears throat> or if you have a, um, a short-term investment in uh, something like a treasury bill, GIC, right? That doesn't, whose value doesn't change. So it can't be a bond because bond values uh, can change and be an investment in shares, but something whose uh, the amount does not change would be a monetary asset. In most of these examples, it's, it's basically cash and accounts. Most of the questions that you'll come across and the uh, in the textbook and most you know the exam questions we tend to keep them not too too complicated cash receive anything that's receivable tends to be the monetary asset inventory onwards prepaid inventory those are all non monetary All right, so we looked at inventory. What else did we have? We have land. So what happened to land? We had a beginning land balance of 2.5 mil, ending land balance is 2.2 mil. Now land is not depreciated. So what else could be the reason for the land value going down? Uh, maybe they were using the revaluation model, but then it's a US company, US cap doesn't have it revaluation model. Oh, let's read the additional information. Oh, United sold some land, right? So the reason why the carrying amount of the land went down is because the United sold some land. We sold land, 
that would have resulted in an increase to your net monetary position. You either sold the land for cash or you had some kind of a receivable on that land sale. So the sale off of fixed asset results in an increase to your net monetary position. So we sold land with a carrying amount of 300,000. That would be an increase in net monetary position. 300,000. And then for the plant and equipment, we already know that plant and equipment was purchased during the year 1.2 million. So that is a reduction to net monetary position, purchase of equipment 1.2 mil. Okay, am I going at just about the right pace? Am I going too fast, too slow? If you say so. Okay, then we're, we've looked through all the non-monetary assets. We gotta now look at the shareholders equity side, no change to the common shares. Uh, and typically that will be the case in pretty much all the examples that you'll come across. Of course, if the company had issued more, more shares during the year, then that would be an increase to the net monetary position, unless that issuance was a non-monetary transaction. Yeah, so I would say don't worry about the common shares part. Once you have a control established, it's very rare for the subs common shares number to change. Um, but retained earnings changed, right? Retained earnings changed. Beginning retained earnings, 2,960,000. Ending retained earnings is 2,770,000. So retained earnings changed in the year. Beginning balance was 2,960,000. Ending balance is 2,770,000. The net income for the year had been 1,296,000 US dollars. So net, net income we know increases retained earnings. And then what else will cause a change? Well, there's dividends. So if you calculate the dividends, beginning balance for retained earnings plus the net income minus the ending retained earnings, we get dividends $1,486,000. With dividends being declared, net monetary position decreases. Dividends you need to subtract. So we had beginning net monetary position, which was a liability of 4 million and 10,000 US dollars during the year the changes that would have happened to net monetary position were a result of sales, 10 million increase, selling and admin expenses, excluding depreciation, a decrease of 984,000, other expenses, 836,000 decrease, interest expense, decrease of 420,000, income tax expense, decrease of 864,000, purchase of inventory, a decrease of 4,330,000. Sale of land, increase of net monetary position, 300,000 US dollars. Purchase of equipment, decrease of net monetary position, 1.2 million US dollars. And then the dividends, 1,486,000 US dollars. These are all numbers in US dollars. If you add these changes to the beginning net monetary position, you sum things up, you should get the calculated ending net monetary position of negative 3,830,000, which by the way, has to be equal to our actual, like the whole point of doing this exercise is to make sure that we have captured everything 
that caused a change to the net monetary position. And this is a good way of checking when you have like that you have everything that affected net monetary position in there, right? So this is important to be able to con confirm that the actual ending net monetary position is basically what you have calculated by including the changes to the beginning net monetary. So of course, actual ending net monetary position in US dollars, 3,830,000 liability, minus the calculated amount of liability of 3,830, means there is no translation gain or loss in US dollars. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we're not translating US dollars into US dollars. There's no, going to be no change, right? US dollars are US dollars. Where there will be a translation gain or loss is when we compare the translated amount of the actual net monetary position to the calculated amount. Then we will have a possible translation gain or a loss. So what that means is these guys here, these changes in the net monetary position, we have to convert into equivalent Canadian dollars. All right, so in the lesson notes, as well as the lecture video, I gave you, I, I went through the uh, rates to use. So sales, because they occur to e evenly over the year, you want to use the average rate for the year. So average rate for 2008 is 1.26. Sales translate at an average rate of 1.26. The selling and admin expenses, typically, you know, these include salespeople salaries, rent on the office building, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are occurred, they are incurred evenly over the year. So use an average rate. Interest expense, other expenses, interest expense, income tax expense. Translate using average rate as well. Pretty much all of your expenses are translated using the average rate. For the purchase of inventory, we're told that purchase of inventory occurred evenly throughout the year. So if it occurred evenly throughout the year, you can very well go ahead and use the average rate for the year for the purchase of inventory as well. Now for the sale of land, you want to use historical rate, but not for when the land was sold. The land was sold on October 15th. You don't want to use the rate for when the land was sold, but rather when the land had been originally purchased. So the land that was sold in year eight, when was it originally purchased? So for the April 1st, what happened was they purchased equipment. April 1st, they had purchased some equipment. The land we sold. Remember this land was sitting on the balance sheet, 2.5 million. Then during year eight, it dropped from 2.5 million to 2.2 million. So when was this land actually purchased? Look at the second bullet, all of its non-current assets, all of United's non-current assets at December 31st, 2007. So as I pointed out, the land had, had existed. Land existed at the end of year seven. This land value existed. So because the land was there at the end of 2007, it is part of these non-current assets at December 31st. These had been purchased on Jan 1st, 2003. Right? The land had been purchased 
on Jan 1st, 2003. So do we have an exchange rate for Jan 1st, 2003? Of course we have an exchange rate for Jan 1st, 2003, it's 1.45. However, when using historical rates, we cannot use a rate for a date that precedes the date of acquisition of the subsidiary. So when did the Canadian company CMC acquire United? What was the date of acquisition by the Canadian parent? December 31st, 2005. So we cannot go back to a date that precedes December 31st, 2005. So yes, we have exchange rate for Jan 1st year three, but guess what? We are not allowed to use. So that should be one of the first things to do. You wanna look at when the subsidiary was acquired. So keep that date, December 31st, 2005. Any information from before that, cross it out so that you do not mistakenly use it. The information will be there. Why was it there? Well, it's there to confuse you, right? So you need to know what rates you can use and what rates you cannot use. So you cannot use the 1.45, but you need to use a historical rate. So the farthest that you can go is to the date of acquisition and the rate on the date of acquisition of the of United was 1.38. So for the sale of land, use 1.38. Brittany's got a comment here. Use rate for when the land was purchased, but Brittany, you want to add a little bit of proviso? Yes, but in this case, because the acquisition date was December 31st, 2005, use the rate on acquisition. Very good. That's the way to kind of remind yourself as to why we're doing the things we're doing. Huh? So is this, is this good? We want to use the rate for when the land had originally been purchased. However, we cannot go farther in time than the date of acquisition of the sub. So because the land had been bought Jan first year three, and the sub had been acquired by the Canadian parent on December 31st, year five, use the rate for December 31st, year five. Okay. Purchase of equipment. Well, when was the equipment purchased? The equipment was purchased on April 1st. Purchased equipment costing 1.2 mil on April 1st. April 1st, 2008, the rate was 1.3. 1.3. And then the last item for us is dividends. For dividends, use the exchange rate for when the dividends were declared. In this question, Dividends were declared and paid on September 30th, 2008. Now it could very well have been, I could have given you two different dates. I could have said, United declared dividends on September 30th. These were paid on something else, October 15th. So you wanna use the rate for when the dividends are declared, not when the dividends are paid. Of course, the dividends won't be paid before being declared. So the earlier of the two dates will be the date of declaration. Use the exchange rate for the date of declaration of the dividend, when the dividends are declared. So here it's September 30th, the rate is 1.24. Now, can you imagine doing this question by hand, like how much time it would take and so on? The 
the good news is you won't have to do it by hand. So you will trust Excel to do the math for you. So sales, 10 million, translated at 1.26. Selling and admin expenses, 984,000, translated at 1.26, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You convert into Canadians. These are your Canadian dollar equivalents. Add these changes in Canadian dollars to the beginning net monetary position, and you get the ending net monetary position calculated. So sum of this 5,333,300 and all of these changes, you get the translate, the calculated ending net monetary position a liability of 5,088,780. Based on our translated amounts, the ending net monetary position of 3,830,000 US dollars should be, in Canadian dollars, it should be equal to 5,088,000. But it actually only is 4,672,000. So our liability is smaller. If our liability has gone down, the difference is a gain. So always take actual minus the calculated. So actual liability minus the calculated liability gives us a translation gain of 416,180. We have a translation gain of 416,180. This translation gain is reported in net income. I would just say put gain reported in net income. Because it's very clear. This is a gain, 416,180, and it's reported in net income. Okay, how's that? Now this one, this, this one example contains, what I've tried to do is put together pretty much everything that could show up on an actual exam question. This is, a, so questions that I do in class with you folks are harder than what you would see on the exam. I wouldn't say use the word harder, but maybe, you know, live a little bit longer, a little bit more comprehensive than what you would see. So you're not going to see these many items on the exam question, but you should be prepared for pretty much anything. And so I've tried to give you a flavor of pretty much everything that I could throw in an exam question. When you folks do practice from your textbook problems, you will find that it's, uh, you know, those, those questions will be uh, relatively easier. We'll well, that, at least that's my hope, that you'll feel that they are easier because we are doing the more involved questions in club. And you don't want to wait uh, to complete your connects. Please get those out of the way. They are, they are a nuisance, I know, but you need the marks. Don't wait to do the connect. So to complete the assignments, get the marks in your pocket. Then you can go back and do your practice questions as much as you want. At least your marks will be unaffected. So make sure you're doing the connect stuff. Do not wait. Oh, I've got lots of time. Don't wait. So the exchange rate information will be given to you. Yeah, so the average rates, et cetera, all of that would be given to you. You just need to be sure which one you're picking. There's average for 2008, there's an average for 2007. Like you just need to be careful in which rate you're picking up and so on. The rates will be there. Okay, so we did the calculation of translation gain or loss under the temporal method.
So that was our answer to A part one. Now I just want to compare what happens if the functional currency is the US dollar. So if the functional currency is the US dollar, then we use the current rate method, the presentation currency translation method. And the gain or loss calculation is based on net assets, changes in net assets. Notice a much shorter calculation here. Beginning net assets. Net assets is another term for shareholders equity. So beginning net assets were $3 million in common shares, 2,960,000 for retained earnings. The ending net assets are $3 million of common shares, 2,770,000 in retained earnings. So beginning net assets, 5,960, common shares plus the retained earnings. Ending net assets, actual, $3 million of common shares plus the 2,770,000 for retained earnings. Translation, use the beginning rate for the beginning net assets, 1.33. Closing rate for the ending net assets, 1.2. 1.33 is the rate for December 31st, 2007. 1.22 is the exchange rate for December 31st, 2008. Multiply the net assets by the exchange rate, you get the equivalent Canadian dollars. Now, of course, the translation gain or loss will depend on the difference between the actual ending net assets and the calculated ending net assets. Now, what brings about a change to the net assets? Well, there has been no change to the common shares. So the only change will be with reference to the retained earnings and retained earnings goes up with net income, decreases with dividends. Net income is 1,296,000. Dividends we calculated was 1,486,000. For net income, you translate net income under the PCT, the, temp the current rate method, you translate it using the average rate for the whole year, which was 1.26. And for dividends, use the exchange rate for when the dividends were declared, just like you did for the temporal method. So net income translated using the average rate works out to 1,632,960. Dividends, calculated using the rate for when the dividends were declared, work out to 1,842,640. Now, the calculated ending net assets is beginning net assets plus the net income minus the dividends. So that's 5,770. And of course, that's what it should be. So there shouldn't be any difference as far as the US dollars are concerned. However, when we look at the Canadian dollar equivalent, so beginning, plus the net income minus the dividends in Canadian dollar terms, you get 7,717 and change. Now, unfortunately, when we look at the actual ending net assets, the actual ending net assets is less than what we calculated it to be. And actual ending net assets being a lower number means we actually have a, a translation loss of 677,720. This is a translation loss, which is to be reported in other comprehensive income. So under the current rate method, any translation gain or translation loss is reported in OCI. Under the temporal method, any translation gain or loss is reported in net income. Right? Not only is the calculation different under the two methods, your answers are going to be different under the two methods. And where those translation gains and losses are reported under the two methods is also different. For the current rate method, the gain or loss is reported in other comprehensive income. In the earlier method that we saw, the gain or loss is reported through net income.
And if in your mind you're thinking, which one do I need to know for the exam? I have excellent news for you. You need to know both. Woohoo! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> So that was the calculation of the gain or loss piece. We did the first part here. Next part is to translate the financial statements into Canadian dollars. So basically what they want is for us to express the income statement into Canadian dollars. These are all amounts in US dollars. We have to convert them into um, Canadian dollars. So do you guys want us to do that right away or would you rather take a bit of a breather? Because this will take a little bit of time. So our break might be a little later because I don't want to stop in between. We can take a bit of a breather now if you like. Bit of a bio break, okay. So I'll pause the recording. Let's try not to make it too long. Let's try to be back by no later than 20 after. All right, so what I'm gonna to try to do is so that you're also able to compare. Now you were able to compare hopefully the calculation of the translation gain or loss between the two methods, quite different. One uses the changes in net monetary position. The other one is based on changes in net assets, right? So you need to know which, um, which calculation to do, which calculation to use, uh, if the Canadian dollar was the functional currency and which translation method to use if the foreign currency was the functional currency. So you'll use the first method, the temporal method, when the Canadian dollar is the functional currency. And then the PCT method is used when the foreign currency, the US dollar, Euro, Australian dollar, whatever that might be, is the functional currency. Now, when preparing the translated income statement, uh, if the statement of financial position was given in Canadian dollars for us, then there's no need to do the translation. Then we, will, we can happily go and uh, consolidate it. All right, so the parent is Canadian. If the statement of financial position, et cetera, were all given in Canadian dollars, it's... Uh, we don't have to do any translations. So that won't be, okay? That won't be the case. We're talking about a, oh, so parent is American company. No, we won't have that because, uh, you know, I, I I don't want to complicate things. So the Canadian parent, the parent will be a Canadian company. Subsidiary will be based somewhere else. Could be US, could be anywhere else. Of course, but to answer your question, if you were say a US CPA, you will be doing translations, but then you'll be translating if the, if the parent was from USA, you will need to convert the Canadian dollars into US dollar. The procedure will still be similar and it will depend on what the functional currency is. So, is, so when we say functional currency is a Canadian dollar, that we're using that as shorthand for the functional currency. Is it the same as the parent's functional currency? So the parent company is Canadian, right? So the parent's functional currency is US dollars. Is the subsidiary's functional currency also, uh, you know, US dollars or not? That's the kind of question you like to ask. Sorry, I, 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 I confused you guys there. The parent company here is a, is a Canadian company. So the parent's functional currency is Canadian dollars. Question we ask is, is the subsidiary's functional currency also Canadian dollar or is it not? If the subsidiary's functional currency is also the Canadian dollars, then you will use the temporal rate method, the temporal method. 
If the subsidiary's functional currency is not the Canadian dollar, then you will use the current rate method. For us, the parent company will be Canadian. The subsidiary will be located somewhere else. It'll have a different currency. And we will basically need to know which method to use under the different circumstances. Okay, so for comparing the uh, the income statement amounts, I'm just going to juxtapose. I'm going to show you the FCT method translation, and then I'll show you the presentation currency translation. So you have sales, cost of goods sold, gross profit. Let's just make sure that the, we've got our formulas kicking in here. Um, income before tax with gross profit minus these guys here, these costs. And then income tax expense, 64, net income. Now, remember we had to take out depreciation, so maybe I will make a bit of a change. Let's say selling and admin expenses, excluding depreciation, and then show depreciation expense separately. Depreciation expense we had calculated so was 1.4 million. And selling and admin expenses were 2 million 384 minus the 1.4 million. All right, so that looks like a cleaner uh, income statement. Okay, so net income is 1296 Now, as far as US dollars are concerned, they don't have any other comprehensive income. So, total comprehensive income. is as far as US dollars are concerned, the total comprehensive income is 1,296,000. Now keep in mind that we made room for OCI, but under the FCT method, the gain, the translation gain is reported through net income. So we need to include a place for um, translation gain here. So what you want to do is include a line. Maybe include a line here. For the translation gain or loss. And as far as US dollars are concerned, there is no translation gain or loss. My income before tax is going to be calculated based on this guy minus the sum of up to 128. And then it has, I have to add the trend. Okay. All 
All right. Sorry. I mean, this this the setting it up takes a little bit of time, but hopefully you see that there's no material change to the income statement. It is still ending up with net income of one million two ninety six. I just reshuffled some of the numbers. I took out the depreciation, and I made some room for the translation gain or loss. This piece will be applicable under the temporal method. This line, which is part of the net income calculation. And then the translation gain or loss OCI will be in play for the um, the current rate. Okay. Now, here comes our opportunity to do some calculations as well. So, under the FCT method, cost of goods sold has to be calculated separately and depreciation expense has to be calculated separately as well. The translation gain or loss has already been calculated, right? So we know that the translation, in the case of the temporal method, there was a translation gain of 416,180. So that gain is reported on the translated income statement, we'll have a translation gain of 416,180. Now for the sales, we translate it using the average rate for the year. So average rate for the year was 1.26. So average for the year, 1.26. Sales translate using the average rate. Our selling and admin expenses translate using the average rate. Other expenses, interest expense, income tax expense translate using the average rate. But for cost of the sold, we have to calculate it. Depreciation expense, we have to calculate. All right, so let's do some calculations. For cost of goods sold, we know the calculation is beginning inventory, add purchases, and minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. So for this company, Beginning inventory had been 670,000. Add to that purchases 4,330,000 and then subtract the ending inventory 800,000 will give us cost of goods sold. Of 4.2 mil. Now, when we do the math for the Canadian dollar equivalents, what we do is we use exchange rates that are applicable to the um, to the specifics here. So purchases we know occurred evenly throughout the year. We were told purchases of inventory occurred evenly throughout the year. So purchases occurred evenly throughout the year. You can use the average rate for the year, which is 1.26. So average rate for the year, 1.26. But with regard to the beginning inventory and the ending inventory, we have information provided the inventories on hand on December 31st, 2007 and December 31st, 2008 were purchased in the last quarter of 2007 and 2008 respectively. So temporal method, our preference is to use historical rates unless an average rate would be more 
appropriate. So we not we know when the beginning inventory had been purchased specifically, and we also know when the ending inventory had been purchased specifically. Beginning inventory was bought in the last quarter of 2007. So last quarter of 2007, the average rate for that last quarter of 2007 was 1.34. So beginning inventory was purchased in the last quarter of 2007. Can we use 1.34? Sure, One point, the last quarter of 2007 is, is, a, is a point in time that is after the date of acquisition. So we can very well use it, right? We can very well use 1.34 for the beginning inventory. And the average rate for the last quarter of 2008 is 1.23. That will be the rate to use for the ending inventory. Beginning inventory, 1.34. The average for last quarter of 2007. And ending inventory use the average for the last quarter of 2008, 1.23. So now if we go ahead and translate beginning inventory into Canadian dollars, we get 897,800. Purchases, uh, what is that? Why am I getting this? Oh because I added rather than multiply. So 5455 five, 800, and then the ending inventory <clears throat> translated into Canadian is 984,000 even. So cost of goods sold now in Canadian dollars is beginning inventory plus purchases minus the ending inventory. So in equivalent Canadian dollars, our cost of goods sold works out to 5,369,600. All right, so as far as the temporal method is concerned, use the calculated amount 5,369,600 for the cost of goods sold. For the sales, you can very well go ahead and multiply with the average rate, and so you will get gross profit of $7,230,400. Selling and admin expenses, translate, you get $1,239,840. Other expenses, you get 1,053,360. Interest expense, you translate, you get 529,200. Income tax expense, you translate, you get this. Now, what's missing is depreciation. So I need a calculation for depreciation. 1.4 million depreciation, I need to calculate. Now, the thing I have to keep in mind is that this depreciation amount of $1.4 million, the depreciation is built, is made up of, my total depreciation is made up of depreciation on the old plant and equipment, and then the depreciation on the new equipment that we bought. We know that the total depreciation for the year is 1.4 million. Right, that's, that's something we know. But we have to figure out out of this 1.4 million, how much is the depreciation in the old plant and equipment and how much is it on the new equipment, right? And the reason for that is that the old plant and equipment, the depreciation is to be translated using the rate for when that plant and equipment was purchased. So the old plant and equipment that existed on December 31st, year seven, remember, was purchased on Jan 1st, 2003. So depreciation on the old plant and equipment will need to be calculated using the historical rate for when the asset, the plant and equipment had been purchased. And that had been purchased on Jan 1st, 2003. 
we can't use the Jan 1st, 2003 number because that date, Jan 1st, 2003, precedes the date of acquisition. So instead of using 1.45, we will have to use 1.38 as the exchange rate for the old plant and equipment depreciation. However, for the new equipment that we bought on April 1st, the $1.2 million worth, this new equipment, the depreciation must be calculated using the historical rate for when this equipment was bought, and that's April 1st. So April 1st, 2008, the exchange rate is 1.3. So we'll have two separate amounts for depreciation in US dollars. When we convert into equivalent Canadian, the new equipment, the depreciation on it must be translated at 1.3. The old plant and equipment depreciation on it must be calculated at 1.38. Okay, because depreciation, remember, is based on historical rate for when the asset was acquired. Okay, does that make sense as to why we have to break up the depreciation? Because the plant and equipment is made up of new equipment and the old plant and equipment. For the new equipment, depreciation has to be translated using the rate for when the equipment was bought. That's 1.3. On the old plant and equipment, we have to use the rate for when that one was bought. We can't use the Jan 1st, 2003 rate. So we will use the rate from the date of acquisition. Are we clear on this? So Hugo has a number, let's double check. So the new equipment, remember we bought on April 1st, $1.2 million. Assume that the new equipment purchase is to be depreciated over eight years, straight line. So $1.2 million divided by eight, the depreciation on the new equipment, 1.2 million divided by eight years gives us 150,000 for a full year. But we have to remember that we only bought the equipment on the 1st of April, right? So 1st of April to December 31st, we are talking about nine months. So always add on your fingers, April, May, June, July, or just, just leave out the months before April 1st. So what do you have? Jan, Feb, March. Three months out, you got nine months. Okay, nine months. So times nine twelfths. So 1.2 million divided by eight times nine twelfths. It's $112,500. Okay, so depreciation should be 112,500 on the new equipment. On the old equipment, it's basically the difference. All right, are we good on that? So I'm good with that. My prepositions are always a little wonky. So now with the exchange rates, the old plant and equipment, you wanna translate using the 1.38 rate. And then the new equipment, you wanna translate using the rate from April 1st, 1.3. So multiply. US dollar amounts by the exchange rates and add them up to get the depreciation. In equivalent Canadian, 1,923,000. 
was a 1.4 million US dollars translated into Canadian dollars using the historical rates as applicable works out to $1,923,000. So now if you do the math, folks, out of the gross profit, you're going to subtract the selling and admin expense, subtract the depreciation expense, subtract the other expenses, subtract the interest expense. Just keep in mind, you need to add the translation gain or loss here, right? So just be a little careful with that. And uh, if you set up your formula correctly, you should get 2,901,180. So if I subtract the income tax expense, I get net income, which is inclusive of the translation gain, 1,812,540. There is no translation. Um, we don't have any OCI, right? So there is no OCI here. So our comprehensive income as well is one million eight twelve five forty under the temporal method. Okay, any questions on this? So you just have to keep in mind cost of goods sold and depreciation, you have to calculate separately. Everything else you can use the average rate. Cost of goods sold, you gotta calculate separately. Depreciation, you gotta watch out for it, calculate separately. How are we doing, folks? Just start thinking about all the ways that you can make a mistake and then watch out that you don't make those mistakes. I remember as a student, I. Uh, well, I was a PhD student and uh, I wanted to also do my CGA on the side. So I was at UFC doing my PhD and uh, I was so full of myself. And I said, okay, I'm going to take uh, the CGA courses. And I needed to take this course because in India, when I did my BCom in India, we didn't have consolidations there at the University of Calcutta that I went to. So I had to take this course and I took this course at SAIT and my instructor at that time was Sandra, who currently I'm co-teaching the course with, you know, have been doing so for so long. I have been teaching for so long now. She's she's really a dinosaur now. But, you know, so she she taught me the, the class and I really uh, was was it not not humble enough? You know, in hindsight, I wasn't humble enough. I thought I was like, you know, I'm a PhD student, you know. I'm sure I'm so smart. And man, I made a I made a hash up. I barely, barely, barely got the minimum mark needed to move on. So um I, I messed it up. Right. So that can be the big thing. Number one, you know, no matter how good a student you are, you can always run into trouble if you are too complacent need to make sure that you understand what's taking place. All right. So since then, like, you know, whenever I teach this course, I don't make it so that, you know, this is so difficult that you're never going to pass. You can definitely do well on this course, but you got to make sure that you understand you follow along. 
This topic is big on the final. It's 25 to 30% of your final. You do well on this question. You are going to do fairly good, fairly well on the final exam. You make a big hash of this piece. That final won't go well for us. Right, so it's not a threat, it's, it's, it's just reality. Make sure you understand what's going on. It is not just a matter of, oh, you know, you multiply some numbers with exchange rate. That multiplication Excel can do for you. It's knowing what rates go where, where you can use an average rate, where you have to use a historical rate. That's the part. So if, if it means making your own notes, making your own ways of remembering, et cetera, uh, I would say do that. You don't have to do 10 different problems. You can do the same problem. Make sure you're able to explain it thoroughly to anybody as to what you're doing, why you're doing it. And you should be good. Okay, so if you don't have any immediate questions on what we just did, let's contrast this. Let's get some comic relief in and let's do the PCT method. So what do we do in the PCT method? We, ladies and gentlemen, take the average rate, just like Thor's hammer, and basically every darned line on the income statement is translated using the average rate. Doesn't matter if it's depreciation or cost of goods sold or you know whatever have you, every darn thing is just translated using the average rate. So basically the impact of that is that we get we get a net income number that we could have basically just calculated by multiplying the net income by the average rate. So you could have just multiplied the net income by the average rate to get the translated Canadian dollar amount, 1,632,90. Everything is translated using the average rate. Yeah, everything is translated using the average rate. Why did I get this? So PCT method, once again, folks, everything is translated using the average rate. So what's missing? We've got the OCI missing, right? So OCI, other comprehensive income, remember, we calculated a translation loss of 677.720. Under the presentation currency translation method, we're going to have a loss, 7720. Come on, format painter. So 677.720 loss, when you add to the net income number, you get comprehensive income for the year 955,240. So 955,240 becomes a comprehensive income compared to 
1,812,540 under the FCT method. We didn't have to calculate the cost of goods sold. We didn't have to calculate depreciation. We could just go ahead and use the average rate, but look at how markedly different these two amounts are under the two methods, two very different outcomes. You guys have gone very quiet and I'm a little concerned now. Just give me some indication. Is this making sense? Are you okay with it? Are you totally lost here? So it's not about what benefits the company. That's really not the way to frame it. You want to make sure that you're presenting the information to the financial users uh, in a way that reflects economic reality. Then, so that is related to whether the subsidiary is indeed a, um, whether the subsidiary is is essentially integrated with the Canadian parent and just an extension of the Canadian parent's operations, or if it is um, self-sustaining, if it is. So think of, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure what everybody's uh, life situation is uh, in life, but, you know, maybe some of you can, can, can relate to it. So I have a, so say my son, he was 13 now, in a few years time, he'd be, be done his high school and then he will decide if he wants to go to university. I hope he goes to university. Now he could go, um, you know, he could go to university here in Calgary or if he's, you know, if his grades are good, then I'll support him if he wants to go, you know, study at UBC, U of T, et cetera. So say he goes, you know, to the East, he goes, he wants to do, he wants to study in the East. Now, I'm an East Indian parent, so I don't know how many of you will understand our culture. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents supported me uh, in my studies, and I feel it is my obligation as a parent to help out my kids with their education, higher education. So I've put aside some money in the RESB accounts to pay for that. So while my son is in uh, Toronto, I will foot the bill for his tuition, I will foot the bill for his, uh, you know, condo rent, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all of his costs. So even though physically my son will be away from me, so that is kind of like this subsidiary in a distant place, the Canadian parent, foreign subsidiary, but if the foreign subsidiary is just an extension of the Canadian parent, and the Canadian parent has to, you know, is, is really involved in the day-to-day -day management of the foreign subsidiary, helps it pay its bills and so on, just like I will be paying my son's bills and so on. And that is, you know, whatever is happening there. I, so just to make it more like a foreign thing, if my son decides to go study in the States, then I will have to pay his bills in US dollars. So whatever happens to exchange rates between Canadian dollar and US dollar, I will suffer or benefit, right? As exchange rates fluctuate. My son really is not concerned there. Just an extension of, well, my immediate family here. Now that could be a different situation if say my son were in his mid twenties, he's done his studying and now he decides that he wants to kind of work in New York. You know, he doesn't rely on me economically, financially, et cetera. So I, I, I would still try to be in touch with them. Hopefully he finds a nice soulmate. Hopefully they settle down. I and my wife will be invested in the well-being of my son. We will be happy to look forward to having grandkids and so on. But really we wouldn't have to worry about helping out my son on a day-to-day -day basis. At least that would be the whole point. So that was the situation of a self-sustaining subsidiary. If you have a self-sustaining subsidiary, the Canadian parent basically just keeps a watchful eye and the eye is towards the net investment, right? So the net asset is the equity. The Canadian parent is looks at its equity, right? 
and says, okay, what's happening to the equity? Is it changed? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? And so you're kind of looking at just the shareholders' equity portion, the net assets, rather than going through the nitty gritty of the overall net monetary position. All right. So coming back to Hugo's question of benefits of one over the other, you you don't want to be strategic here in picking. You want to make sure that you're presenting the information appropriately, depending on how the subsidiaries, what the subsidiary status is. If it is integrated, you need to use the temporal method. If it is a self-sustaining subsidiary, you need to use the current rate method. Okay. Now, when the criteria are closed, that's a great point. When the criteria are closed, uh, keep in mind it's a one-time decision. You don't get to change your mind every year. You'll have to then establish, and uh, that that change in accounting uh, might have might be might need a trigger to, you know, you might have to restate past numbers and so on. So you have to make that choice very wisely, right? So there, maybe the Canadian parents, the management at the Canadian parents should think about what their intentions are overall. So initially, if it's a, if you're just starting out in a foreign country, the subsidiary might need some help or leg up from the Canadian parent. But in the longer run, if the hope is that the subsidiary will be operated autonomously, et cetera, et cetera, then it may still make sense. Even when the criteria are very close, you may want to make a call of using the PCT method. Right? So that's what I would suggest. Now, admittedly, sometimes management tends to be myopic. So there, what you have to do is you want to look at which way exchange rates are going. So if the exchange rates have, well, if the Canadian dollar is strengthening relative to the US, uh, relative to the foreign currency, that's what happened in this case. So the Canadian dollar strengthened right, relative to the US dollar. So when you have that, using the PCT method will result in a loss, right? Because your net assets will be translated using the lower exchange rate at the end compared to the one at the beginning, right? Whereas under the temporal method, you will likely end up with a gain because you know when you're factoring in expenses and so on, uh, you're you're averaging those out. And, you know, so it, it it for a one time thing, you might just want to, you might just, you know what, you might just ask your accountants to make the two translated, two sets of translated numbers and see which one is better. Of course, keep in mind under the FCT method, the temporal method, the gain or loss is included in net income. So if you have any kind of debt covenants and so on, you may have to think about, okay, so does, does this help me? Does this not? Because reporting something in net income can boost your earnings per share. If you as managers are rewarded with bonuses and so on based on reported net income number, then I guess using the temporal method is, is a little bit to your advantage because you'll get rewarded with bonuses on a higher amount of net income. Uh, the PCT method does not report the gains and losses into income. It, it keeps them outside of net income. So if you are concerned more about uh, uh, sort of maintaining a stable stability, uh, then you don't want the translation gains and losses from converting the subsidiaries numbers into Canadian dollars in net income. Well, then maybe go with PCT. But there are a lot of other factors that you'll have to keep in mind. Feroz had a question about, is the required info for A and B, retained earnings and OCI uh, for December 2007 extra info? Um, are you talking about here, the translated retained earnings? Are you talking about this piece here, Feroz? Yeah? Oh, we're gonna need this. We're gonna need this for the balance sheet. We just made an income statement. We gotta do a balance sheet. Okay. So you folks okay with the income statement portion though?
ask a yes all right then let's go make a translated balance sheet statement of financial position And again, I would just show it to you folks in this manner so that you're able to compare the two methods. So here we go, copy the information. We just need the year eight information. So year eight, we have do do do. Okay, we need uh, an extra line here for accumulated other comprehensive income. Accumulated other comprehensive income. And we're looking at for assets ten million four hundred and thirty thousand. Total liabilities and equities ten million four hundred and thirty thousand as well. Now, what you want to do here is note that under the FCT method, the monetary items, right, are monetary items are translated using the closing rate for the year. Closing rate for the year is the rate on December 31st, 2008. The rate on December 31st, 2008 was 1.22. So 1.22, that's the exchange rate. 56. So use 1.22 for the monetary assets and the monetary liabilities. For common shares, always use the exchange rate always use the exchange rate on the date of acquisition. Common shares use the exchange rate from the date of acquisition. The date of acquisition was December 31st, 2005, so 1.38. Retained earnings, you have to calculate. And AOCI is also calculated. In the case of the FCT method, we don't have any AOCI, so it's not applicable here. For the inventory, land and the plant and equipment, the non-monetary assets, you want to use the historical rate for when the asset was acquired. So ending inventory had been purchased in the last quarter of 2008. So average for the last quarter of 2008 was 1.23. The land had been acquired on Dan first year three, can't use that rate. So use the rate from the date of acquisition, 1.38. The plant and equipment, because this plant and equipment number is made up of two pieces, you have the old plant and equipment and then the new equipment that was purchased in year eight, this one, 
you have to calculate separately because it's made up of two parts. You have to calculate separately. You have to use historical rate for both the pieces. And I have to do some calculations. Just to start with the plant and equipment. Old plant and equipment, new equipment, total plant and equipment. Now we know that the total plant and equipment is 6.6 .6 million. Out of that 6.6 .6 million, the new equipment must be 1.2 million minus the depreciation recorded 112,500. So the net book value of the new equipment equipment is the 1.2 million cost minus the 112,500, 1,087,500. The old plant and equipment therefore is what's left. Okay, does that make sense? Total plant and equipment is 6.6 .6 million, of which the new equipment will account for a million eighty-seven five hundred. The rest is the old plant and equipment. Does that make sense, folks? Yeah. Okay. Now the rates to use 1.38 for the old plant and equipment and 1.3 for the new plant and equipment. Now, if you calculate the equivalent Canadian values, you get total plant and equipment, $9,021,000. $7,607,250 for the old plant and equipment at 1.38, $1,413,750 for the new equipment at 1.30. Plant and equipment, 9,021,000. You can translate these other numbers. They should be fairly straightforward. Calculate a total of the assets. You get, in Canadian dollars, the total assets works out to 14 million. $53,600. Do the same thing for the liabilities. Of course, we don't have any accumulated OCI. So the last thing that remains is the retained earnings numbers. So for retained earnings, the calculation is beginning retained earnings. Add net income, less the dividends equals ending retained earnings. The so beginning retained earnings was 2,960,000. Net income, 1,296,000. Dividends, 1,486,000. 
ending retained earnings 2 million 770. Yeah. Now, what exchange rates do we use? For the beginning retained earnings, we don't use an exchange rate because this is a calculated amount. In our case, it's given, right? So it's given to us, but it's basically a carried forward amount, right? So I should use carried forward amount. The amount given in the problem, the translated beginning retained earnings, on December 31st, 2007 was 4,258,500, So 4258,500. The net income number we calculated, okay, we had done the math for net income when we calculated the translation gain or loss. Oh, no, not there here. The net income is 1812540 And the dividends, you want to use the exchange rate for when the dividends were declared. So the dividends were declared on September 30th. So that's 1.24. So beginning number was given to us. We use the rest of the information. To calculate the ending retained earnings, the ending retained earnings is four million two twenty eight four hundred. If the beginning number wasn't given, I'll show you a hack for it in a second, but typically that amount should be known to us. If not, I'll show you a hack. Okay, 4,228,400, that's our ending retained earnings. So plug that in here, 4,228,400, and then cross your fingers. Hopefully, if we've done it right, we should see the same amount as the total asset. Balance sheet is valid. Total of the balance sheet, 14,053,600. Okay, are we good? So, Julia, is it okay if I came back to that hack after I've completed the question? Is that all right? Yeah, because on an exam, I'll give you that number. If I ask you, if I'm asking, if I'm going to ask you for retained earnings, or if I'm going to ask you for a translated balance sheet, I need to give you the information needed, right? But it's a fair question, and I, I have an answer for it. I just don't want to distract the class from what we're doing. So this is basically the FCT method. You've got your balance sheet done. Now, when you're looking at the PCT method, all of the assets and all of the liabilities are translated using the closing rate. You don't care whether they are monetary or non-monetary. So all the assets and all the liabilities are translated using the closing rate.
So that gives us a different total for the total assets. For the liabilities, we got basically the same numbers as the FCT method. Common shares, you will always translate, no matter what method you're using, you will always translate using, oops, you will always translate the common shares using the exchange rate on the date of acquisition. So doesn't matter if it's the FCT method or the PCT method, common shares, you will always translate at the historical rate from the date of acquisition. So that basically brings us to the retained earnings and the AOCI. Now the retained earnings and AOCI are to be calculated. These are calculated numbers. Okay. Retained earnings and accumulated OCI are calculated numbers. So we have to do calculation. So as far as the beginning retained earnings is concerned, it has to be the carried forward amount given in the problem. So in the problem, we were given the beginning retained earnings, translated retained earnings, $3,822,000. So $3,822,000 was the beginning retained earnings. For net income, under the PCT method, remember net income was translated using an average rate. So just use the average rate. And dividends, you translate using the rate when the dividends were declared. So you do the math and we get Retained earnings under the PCT method work out to 3,612,320. All right. That leaves us with accumulated other comprehensive income, AOCI. And the AOCI you have beginning AOCI balance. Add the OCI for the year. And then you'll have the ending AOCI. Now, as far as US dollars are concerned, there was no OCI, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all like, you know, your beginning AOCI is gonna be a carried forward amount. OCI for 2008 is something that we calculated. So beginning accumulated other comprehensive income was a deficit of 35,200 Canadian dollars. Deficit means it was a negative balance, right? Negative 35,200. For the year, remember we had calculated a translation loss, 677,720. So if you add the two together, our accumulated deficit as far as, as EOCI is concerned, works out to 712920. 712920. So if you now add up the total of the liabilities and equity, you get 12,724,600.
example, your balance sheet is balanced. You compare the two numbers, you have different balance sheet sizes for sure, because that's a factor of what rates you've used. But you'd also notice that uh, there is a pretty big accumulated OCI deficit under the PCT method. And the reasoning for that is that over the years, the Canadian dollar has been strengthening against the US dollars, right? Starting at 1.38, like the rate at the end of 2008 was 1.22. With the US dollar strengthening, you will see losses from the point of view of net assets. All right, are we good with this? Oh, I should have used the current rate method. PCT is the other name, current rate method. So yeah, that's all I had for, for this piece. You need to know how to calculate the, first of all, you need to know what factors determine functional currency, right? That's the conceptual piece. And then from the actual nitty gritties, the calculations, you need to know how the gain or loss is calculated under the two methods. First of all, you need to remember which method to use when, so use the temporal method when the Canadian dollar is a functional currency. If you're using the temporal method, gain or loss is calculated based on net monetary position. The resulting gain or loss is reported in net income. When translating the income statement, cost of goods sold and depreciation expense have to be calculated separately. Everything else you can use the average rates. When making the balance sheet, monetary assets and monetary liabilities must be translated using the closing rate for the year. Non-monetary assets must be translated using historical rates. When you have some number that is composite, that is made up of two parts, like we saw for plant and equipment, 6.6 .6 million was made up of two separate amounts, the old plant and equipment and the new equipment, then you have to do a separate calculation to figure out the translated Canadian dollar equivalent. Common shares always translate using the exchange rate on the date of acquisition. Retained earnings has to be calculated. Under the PCT method, the gain or loss is calculated based on changes in net assets. So that calculation is straightforward. On the income statement, basically the entire income statement is converted using the average rate. Just need to remember to put the gain or loss under OCI. When making the balance sheet, all the assets and all the liabilities are translated using the closing rate. Common shares are translated using the rate from the date of acquisition. So it really boils down to your retained earnings and OCI, which have to be calculated as continuity numbers.